I must admit I have a problem with Mark's story about the call of these first disciples. When I was younger, I didn't have this problem. I, I could envision these two sets of brothers, James and John, Simon and Andrew, dropping their nets in the shallows and jumping out of the boat and following Jesus without even a glance at their elders they were leaving behind. Why not? I grew up in the 1960s. This seemed like a really 60-ish kind of passage to me. <laughs> it was easy to picture a, a long-haired Jesus walking along the shore in his tired, soled sandals, calling the disciples to come and jump in his Volkswagen bus and drive along away from the establishment. Groovy, that's great. Now with my own sons having flown rather far from the nest, I just keep seeing poor old Zebedee, the father of James and John, sitting in the boat which used to be the family business, watching his pension and his 401k going off down the beach with Jesus. What, what would make you or me do what those two sets of brothers did? To drop everything in an instant and just walk away. A telephone call from the emergency room, perhaps? A winning number in the Florida lottery? A doctor's diagnosis saying you just have a few months left. It would have to be something dramatic, wouldn't it? Something, something really good or really bad. A bolt out of the blue. An opportunity that had to be seized. Perhaps that's how Mark wants us to see the whole of the gospel. Something so radical, so promising, so wonderful that it's worth leaving kith and kin, family and loved ones, present comforts and future security just for the chance to follow Jesus. Or maybe, maybe Mark is making an even bigger claim about the good news of Jesus Christ. It's a cosmic force, perhaps, a movement of God that is carrying the whole creation toward God's future. Perhaps this story is about how these wild and crazy men left their nets and their, their families, or perhaps it's about how wild and crazy God is to sweep us up along with the rest of the humanity into this kingdom that is drawing nigh. Read either way, these three elements, there are three elements of this passage I think are really quite interesting. First, it begins with a message. The same message that John the Baptist proclaims in his proclamation, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. This is John's message. Jesus takes it up, but notice he doesn't mention remorse for sins or guilt or fleeing from the wrath to come. I don't think uh, J J Jesus is calling for the kind of repentance that waits until we feel sufficiently guilty for before we act. Now, let's see. L last week, I told a dozen lies. I, 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 I took the Lord's name in vain. Three, no, no, four times. I coveted, but just once, if, if you don't count the way I looked at that flat screen TV, is that enough sins to repent of? Or should I wait until I have a cup of, couple of mortal sins under my belt? I don't think Jesus is calling for this kind of repentance the kind that hinges on remorse or guilt or scorekeeping. Instead, to repent in this context means to turn around, to change course, to, to head in a different direction. Once when Andrew and I were students traveling uh, across Europe, we got on a lovely train to Naples. 
we were really enjoying the trip, looking out the window, when we realized it was a train to Rome, not Naples. <laughs> so we got off at the next platform and waited for another train. That is repentance. Repent, says Jesus, you're headed in the wrong direction. God's kingdom is that way. Get with the business of the kingdom. So the gospel is about repentance. Second, it's, it's about a person. Follow me, Jesus says. Not study my philosophy, not come to my seminar, not take my course in self-improvement, but just follow me. Dr. Randy Taylor was the first moderator of the reunited church, the church that got together in 1983. I remember him telling a group of us long after he had retired about a stint he, he had as a teacher of New Testament at um, Warren Wilson College up in Swannanoa, North Carolina. Warren Wilson's a Presbyterian school, but it's pretty unorthodox. Students there reminded Dr. Taylor of the students he knew in Berkeley, California, when he was the president out there of one of our seminaries. Like many in their generation, the students at Warren Wilson were not exactly biblically literate. They, they realized, he realized from the first day of class they, they didn't really know anything about the New Testament. They didn't know anything about the Old Testament. They, they didn't know anything about Judaism or even Christianity. But he said they were bright and they were so eager to learn. They were forever challenging his assumptions. Well, he told us, I learned a lot from those students. They didn't like Matthew. They didn't like Mark. They didn't like Paul. They didn't like me. But they liked Jesus. They liked Jesus very much. I once was invited to preach at a residential boys' school in Scotland. It was one of these rugged kind of places, a kind of highland Eton where the students ran up mountains and took cold, freezing showers and wore kilts to their Sunday morning worship service. I was a student myself at the time for preparing for, for ministry. I worked for weeks on that sermon. I put everything I knew into it, and it was terrible. <laughs> I got on the train and was met by the headmaster and wined and dined on Saturday night. And then on Sunday morning, I climbed up into this massive pulpit in the school chapel and looked for a place to put my notes. And there, carved into the oak where only the preacher could see it were these words, Sir, we would see Jesus. Isn't that what preaching is supposed to be about? Showing people Jesus. Isn't that what the church is for? Isn't that what each of us is called to do to show people Jesus? Before it's a religion, or a philosophy, or a worldview, the Christian faith is a relationship. A relationship with a person who is at this very moment alive and beckoning us into a deeper communion with him. Follow me. Sir, we would see Jesus. So the gospel is about repentance. It's about a person, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ of God. And last of all, it's an invitation to follow. Lots of commentators speculate on this, this calling passage and say, well, you know, it must not have happened exactly the way Mark tells it, or even the way Matthew tells it. Surely Jesus had met these disciples before, uh, had a long chat with them, and and. This was the third or fourth encounter, and he'd already arranged everything, and so he just said, follow me, and of course, they, they followed because it had all been set up. But Mark says no. 
He says they never lied, laid eyes on Jesus before he called them and said, follow me. Reasonable people just don't drop everything and follow a stranger. This defies all logic. But what if Mark is not trying to be logical? Suppose he's showing us what it means to be disciples. In Mark's day, there were masters and there were disciples. The disciples were the followers. The masters were the ones who had the answers and it was the followers' job to try to figure out which questions to ask. Speaking for myself, I've never been particularly attracted to the brand of Christianity that sees the church as the place with all the answers and Christians as the experts about God. I'm happy for people to be confident in their faith. What bothers me is the arrogance that puts, it, puts disciples ahead of instead of behind their master. Yesterday, the Presbytery of Florida met. The most controversial and prominent item on the agenda was a proposal to change the definition of marriage in our denomination's constitution from that of a civil contract between a man and a woman to a contract between two people. On the whole, the debate was polite and respectful and the tone a good deal less abrasive than it has been in past years when the Presbytery has dealt with matters of human sexuality, ordination, and marriage. For so many years, it was common for presbyters to get up and say, there's only one way to look at this issue, and that's the way the Bible sees it, and if you don't see it this way, which is my way, then you must be wrong. This time, all of the speakers talked about the love of God revealed in Jesus Christ and the limits of our understanding about human sexuality. In other words, there was just so much more modesty in the room and a lot more Christian charity. And maybe just a little bit of embarrassment that the culture around us seems to have understood something about marriage that too many Christians seem to have forgotten that marriage is mostly about self-giving love, the love that endures throughout life for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, for better, for worse, in joy and in sorrow. Some people say the church has given into the culture and abandoned the Bible. I say the culture may have prompted the church to read the Bible with Jesus-tinted glasses. If your idea of being a disciple of Jesus Christ is never to change your mind, you really ought to stay in the boat. To follow Jesus is to have your mind changed along with your heart. To follow Jesus is to be struck dumb with surprise, as these disciples soon will be. To follow Jesus is to leave not only your possessions behind, it's to leave your presumptions behind as well. If we're not willing to do that, we might as well stay in the boat. You can't drag your presumptions along with you and keep up with Jesus. The gospel is a summons to repentance. The gospel is an invitation to meet Jesus. The gospel is a call to follow him. Jesus is beckoning, beloved. Oh, come on, let's... Let's get out of the boat. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.